Hello everybody, welcome back again to another uh, edition of Review Time on Game of Thrones, here with Moji. Um, let's start with this episode, um, let's start with Bran's visions. This was a very fillery episode, very fillerish. Um, let's start with... Brand visions. There's, a, there's probably a lot people would have missed in this. Um, unless you go back, you wouldn't catch everything. Wildfire, Pyromancer, Mad King, all sorts of stuff you would have missed. Um, You see, the some of these visions were mashed up to the, 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 some of the visions Bran had a couple seasons ago, you see here. Um, what's interesting was they finally showed us the Mad King. They never, never even inclined to talk about the Mad King, other than maybe when Jamie was with Brienne in season three when they were captured by um, Vargo. Uh, well, in the book, sees Vargo, in the show, it was Locke. Um, when, 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 uh, Jamie got his arm cut off, he tells Brienne of the story of how the Mad King said, burn them all, burn them all, burn them all. Um, he explained to her that the Mad King told Jamie to kill his father, um, which was never going to happen. Um, what people don't sometimes know, uh, remember, um, uh, in the TV show, they didn't get to the expletives, but when... Tywin Lannister was at the gates of King's Landing, okay? In the books, Jamie specifically tells Brienne uh, uh, that Tywin was never one to be on the losing side, okay? So, to th for the Mad King to be such in, 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 in a mental disarray to realize that Tywin Lannister's army is at the gates to think that he's coming to help him was ridiculous Pycelle Grand Maester Pycelle convinced the Mad King to let Tywin's army into the gates Varys told him no, told the Mad King do not let Tywin Lannister come into the city because to get into King's Landing you know, someone has to open the gates, the front gates into the city Varys told him don't do it Pycelle who's an undercover Lannister supporter always has been. He's just a pawn for the Lannisters inside the 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 small council. He told the Mad King, "Let Tywin in." He let him in. Boom! Tywin sacks the city, joins up with Robert. The Mountain kills Elia Martell, kills the Babes, um, Aegon, and I forgot the girl's name, but kills both of them. Rapes Elia. That's why Oberyn. Be is he's got beef with, with them, the late Oberyn Martell. Um, and it was under Tywin's orders that they did this. And in the books, they, they go into the backstory of the T Tywin's actually talking after the Red Wedding. When, when Tyrion is sitting there with his father at the small council table and says, You know, how cheating it was to kill Rob like that, you know, how, how underhanded it was. And Tywin says, Tell me what's so honorable to kill 10,000 men at battle or a couple at dinner, you know? And that's when Tyrion realizes how underhanded his father is. But to get back to the sacking of King's Landing in Robert's Rebellion, Tywin tells, also tells Tyrion in that exact same conversation that they're talking about, the Red Wedding, he tells Tyrion that they needed to, the Lannisters needed to prove how much they supported Robert at that moment because Robert was winning the war. He killed Ray Rhaegar at the Trident. So to prove his allegiance, Tywin not only sacked the city, but he killed Elia Martell. Under, the mountain killed him, killed Elia Martell and the babes, Rhaegar's children, but it was under Tywin's orders. Okay? So all that went down during Robert's Rebellion. I really hope HBO does a prequel on this. And to prove their loyalty to the new king, King Robert, the, the rebel, um, they killed the Martell babes and Elia. So 
It's a little backstory. So, anyways, back to the visions. Got the pyromancers. Jamie kills the pyromancers when he's telling Brienne after the Mad King told him to kill his father when he's inside the city sacking it. Jamie then overheard the king talking to the pyromancers who were at this time in King's Landing, they were elevated to a high status. They even had a seat at the small council. People don't know this, but the pyromancers that dealt with strictly dealt with the wildfire, that's what they they were they, they were elevated to the small council. So these guys cooked up massive amounts of wildfire. They put them all over the city and they were ready to burn the city down on the Mad King's orders. And as soon as Jamie heard this killed the pyromancer, and then went over and killed Mad King Ares, stabbed him in the back, nicknamed Kingslayer now. Ned obviously finds him sitting on the throne with the blood of the king on his hands and the Mad King on the ground dead. Um, when Ned finally comes into the city after Tywin and sees the carnage that Tywin Lannister and his men have done by sacking the city, Ned thought it could have been done peacefully, just gone into the city, the Mad King's dead, you don't need to do all this, but Tywin's men raped and pillaged the whole place, so that's why Ned has never trusted the Lannisters. <clears throat> um, so in the clips in the vision on the show, they show the Mad King saying, burn it down, talking to the Pyromancers, Jamie killing them, but I don't know if many people saw this, but Jamie's hair is short. I don't know if that's a continuity error or what, but Jamie's hair is short. And I mean, like, what he looks like right now. It's not like it's like even half of what his golden locks look like in season one. It's completely what he looks like right now. So this, this was 15, 20 years ago during Robert's Rebellion when Jamie killed the Mad King. Ooh. You, you, you couldn't mess something like that up with short hair, you know? And... I don't know. It's it's just something that bugged me out, and I don't get it. Um, Ladonna, Ladonna from um, James Thrones channel said, you know, we don't know what Jamie looked like during Robert's Rebellion. You know, maybe he had short hair back then. True, it's possible. But um, what else? What else? What else? What else? So yeah, he slits the pyromancer's throat before he kills the Mad King. And in the next vision, um, and we also and, and we're also getting um, some future stuff here. You know that everyone thinks that a lot of people subscribe to the theory that Cersei is going to be the one that burns King's Landing down now with wildfire. You know, so that's another thing with wildfire. Other than the fact that we've only seen it used at the the Battle of Blackwater with Tyrion and his little trick on Stannis. Um, then the next vision is Jamie sitting on the throne, which was nice to also see that. Um, so yeah, I said that. Um, then we see Drogon, what we suspect is Drogon, flying over King's Landing. Pretty interesting. We don't know if that's the future or was that the past. It could have been, it's not, we think it's Drogon, but it could have been dragons from before. It could have been the Targaryen's dragons from before flying over King's Land. It could have been Aegon's dragons. Uh, it could have been Vicini's and um, whatever. could have been, you know, we have no idea. It could have been Balerion the Black Dread from, you know, Aegon's dragon, you know, from 300 years ago. Then the next vision is Hardhome, reminding the audience it's, you know, where we first encountered the, the White Walker army. And John, and funny thing, John wasn't in this episode, which is pretty strange. Like, I think I saw online John's been in 47 out of 50 episodes. I, I cannot remember the last time John wasn't in an episode. So that was interesting. Um, then it goes back to Bran being touched by the Night King with Frost Scale. Remember, I trademarked that word, Frost Scale. Okay, there's a reason they show this again. It was like a GPS that the Knights King used to find them in the cave. But I'm, 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 I'm really interested to see what Bran's arm looks like now, if it's like kind of spreading type of thing, because I really think it's like a grayscale type of deal. Um, and then next vision is the deaths of Ned, Rob, and Catelyn. So we know that this is we, their deaths. Um, 
So we know that Brandstein knows this. He hasn't gotten any messages or, or heard from anybody, but we know that he, he, he's seen their deaths now. It's official. He's gotten it um, in the visions. Um, the next vision was the Tower of Joy, which is interesting. They haven't finished it on the show. They got to go back to that. Um, we got to know. Obviously, we know that Ned heard Bran now. That was official. Blood Raven didn't want him to know that back then, but after what we've seen with Hodor, you know, so they got to go back to the Tower of Joy. They keep sprinkling that back into us. Um, then what's really interesting, in the same sequence, we see a bloody hand. Now go back and look at this. Okay, there's plenty of, you know, videos out there to show you all the visions from the episode. It shows a bloody hand that's Ned's, obviously, and it shows a woman's, woman's limp feminine hand underneath him. Okay, what is the blood? It's the Tower of Joy scene? Come on. All right, another thing of R plus L equals J. Um, pretty surprised that they threw that in there, you know, because I thought, you know, they're going to try to do all the big reveals when they show the video of Leanna in the bed of blood, um, but they just threw that in there which is nice, and, and it's guaranteed Ned's hand because you can see the cufflinks on him. If you look at the battle with um, Arthur Dane, it's the same exact arm, same exact cufflinks, so it's for sure it's Ned. I'm, I'm guessing that's going to be the scene of when he goes upstairs into the tower. Um, next, so that was all the visions, actually. There's no more after that, after that Tower of Joy one. Actually, there's a big winner scene, as a matter of fact. Right after they show the Tower of Joy, then they show a big winner scenery with the sun going down, pretty much telling you that's the land of always winter or the frost fangs or wherever north of the wall, reminding you again, winter is coming. Stark words. So that was a lot. That's a lot. You know, if you don't go back and watch it, you're not going to, you're not going to, you're not going to remember all that because the visions went quick, but that was a lot. Man. I'm really interested about Jamie, the Jamie visions, and them showing that um, for a reason, showing the wildfire for a reason. You know, is this what's going to happen in the future? It's like them telling the audience, hey, remember this wildfire stuff? Next... Um, Next scene was the Tarleys, and I'm just going to skip over this part. This was pure filler. You know, we needed to know what Sam's doing, but at the end of it all, I'm going to compress it down. We just needed to know that he's getting Heart's Bane. He wanted Heart's Bane. He got Heart's Bane. See ya, Sam. I could have done that in five minutes. You know, they could have done that in five minutes. But, all right. King's Landing. Marjorie putting on a show. If you couldn't figure that out, I don't know what to tell you. Two episodes ago, she's sitting there telling Loris when they're in the dungeon, you know, Loris, they want me to flip you. They want me to turn you. They want you to atone, yada, yada, yada. Don't give in. And, like, Loris is looking at her like, I just want it to stop. I don't care what you do. I just want it to stop. So Marjorie's doing this either for her family. She's doing it for her family. She's doing it to not do the walk of atonement, whatever it is. It's a, it's a bamboozle on the high sparrow, okay? It was, it was a charade. Um, and it's funny that they said in the episode, Tommen, when he's talking to her, he's like, the crown and the faith are the twin pillars of our society. And it's the exact same line that Cersei said to the high sparrow when, when the high sparrow was telling her, like when, they, when she fir first met the high sparrow, when Mary and Trent took her into Flea Bottom and... He's explaining to her what he is and what he does. And, he, and she's like, at the end of all the whole thing, when she's about to give him power like an idiot that she is, she says, the crown and the faith are the twin pillars of, of, of everyone. So we have to get those two together. So we have to marry the, the crown and the faith. Biggest mistake of her life. She thought she was, that was when Cersei thought she was smart. Not smart anymore, are you? You dummy. Um... So, yeah, the whole thing you need to know right there is Marjorie's bullshit. Then, 
We go to Arya in the play. Love these meta plays. Excellent stuff right here. Um, this is interesting. They're doing the Red Wedding. The play actors are doing the Red Wedding. And um, you can they've confirmed to us now that the young actress is the one who paid the faceless men to kill the older actress because she's sitting there mouthing the words to the play, you know, sweating the older actress while she's doing her part, you know, so that young actress, it's like confirmed. And Arya sees that shit and she's like, okay. And then what's interesting in this is when the play's over and Arya goes backstage, the older actress goes right up to her, like, girl. And she used the word girl too. It's like, I know that's like a normal word, but like, girl, you know, Jack always says that. You know what I mean? She's like, girl. How many times have you been to this play? You know, randomly just comes up to her. Out of all the people in the back, she comes up to Arya. Um, so Arya tells her how many times, and, and the actress is pretending like, you know, acting like, okay, she might want to be an actress or whatever. She, she asks Arya specifically, do you know how to act? Have you ever used other people's faces? Really? So you know where that's going. Um... And then Arya kind of freezes on that, whatever. But some, just my, the whole point I'm getting to is something's not right with this actress. In my opinion, this whole thing was a test. And it was either a test for Arya or it was a test for the waif. Okay? I'm going to get to the waif in a second. So after that whole hoopla, the actress tells her, Arya still put the, put the poison in the drink. You know, because I guess she is a killer. You know, that's what it's trying to tell you. She's a killer. But she comes back, knocks the drink out of her hand, then tells her the young actress is the one who wants you dead. And immediately the waif sees this. And I'm like, has the waif been there the whole time? Is she working with, with the troop too? Has she been chilling with the troop? Has Arya never seen her being there? You know, did she not think that the waif was going to see it immediately that she didn't poison her? So, whatever that is, um, the waif goes right back to Jack and tells her she didn't do it. And the, 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 the Jack and says, you know, shame. The girl had many gifts. And the waif says, you promised me. Now, that's interesting. What do you mean you promised me? Like, that's kind of strange. Like, I know the waif wants her dead, but that's, like, strange. Like, you promised me? So she said something to Jockin, and then Jockin gave her a reply back. Like, I, I promise. That's real interesting if you didn't catch that. And then he says, don't make her suffer. So you're led to believe that Jockin has feelings for Arya. He doesn't mind that she's dead, but he has feelings for her. It's kind of like with Arya poisoning the water, but then knocking it out. It's like, you know, Arya is a killer at the end of the day. But at the, on top of that, on the, at the end of the day, she didn't want to go through with it because she has a conscience. Just to her, this lady's innocent. So Jockin, at the end of the day, he likes Arya, but he knocked the, the poison out of the hand. Don't make her suffer. You know what I'm saying? So it's a little thing right there. And... I just think the whole thing was a test for the waif. I was at the beginning thinking this whole mummer's farce, this this troop thing with the actors and the play, it was a test. You, you're supposed to think it's a test for Arya, but I think it's a test for the waif. And I think the waif is getting tested by Jackin, the kindly man or whoever the faceless men leader is. Because I think the waif isn't officially official yet i think like there's like a couple tiers to being a faceless man Arya being at the bottom jack and being at the top the waif being in the middle and the animosity the waif has for Arya down here it just doesn't make sense I, like we get it she doesn't like her but it feels like to get up here the waif is being put through something else another test and it's like it has something to do with Arya. so Arya gets needle you know nice She's a star. Gets a needle and um, goes into like some, you know, canal. 
has her candle and like she's ready for the wave. She's ready. She's ready to knock her socks off. She turns the light off, which I think is a is a is a thing nodding back to her being blind. And she she wants to fight her in the dark. So all this wasting time with Ar- watching Arya get her ass kicked, I think it's gonna be a big payoff. It's gonna be a big, big, big payoff uh, against the waif. Next, um, we go to the phrase. Very interesting. Very, very, very interesting with, with the phrase. We're back in River Run, uh, Riverlands, at the Twins, and we're immediately seeing. Walder Frey with his new wife, because obviously Catelyn killed his wife at the Red Wedding, his, first, his, his young wife back then. This girl looks like she's about 12 or 13. Now that leads me to believe, I got a theory here, Arya's going to use that girl's face. She's going to use Walder Frey's new wife's face and kill him. You heard it here first. I haven't heard nobody else say that. And if somebody did, God bless you. Um, I, so I want to I wanna get back to my... This is what you missed. Walder Frey says, We took River Run and you lost it. He's talking to his idiot sons. Uh, Black Walder and um, Lothar Frey. Uh, I believe that's what his name is. The one who killed Catelyn at the Red Wedding, his name is Lothar. The one who killed Rob was Blackwalder, I believe. Then Walder Frey says, we have ten times the men of the Blackfish. Blackwalder says, the Brotherhood without banners are helping them. They're, they're, they're attacking our supply lines. So, they're letting us know the Brotherhood Without Banners are back in town. So major, I can't wait for the Riverlands. Which then Walder replies, um, they're laughing at us. I want them to choke on their laughter. Which is, he's saying that the the people of the Riverlands are laughing at them. I don't know, people at King's Landing, because they couldn't even hold River Run. They took the castle. They killed everybody at the Red Wedding. They killed all the Northmen. And they couldn't even hold on to, to, to River Run. So, but, but key word here, I want them to choke on their laughter. I'm getting to a point here. Okay. Brotherhood Without Banners. I want them to choke on their laughter. Then, um, after he says that, then Black Walder says... The blackfish won't yield. And which then Walder Frey says, show them the knife we used to kill his niece and slit her throat with. Show you, Black Walder, and you, Lothar, I want you to show him the knife that you used to kill his grandnephew and his horrible wife. Show them that knife. So he's telling you that so there was two knives, two, two knives. One knife killed Catelyn, one knife killed Rob. Well, no, one killed um, Rob's wife, Jalisa, whatever her name was. Rob got killed with a with a with a bow and arrow. Uh, but yeah, there was two knives. So I mean, did he have to say two knives? Y'all two both killed them separately. I mean, it was a massacre. But I mean, I. I it's pointing to something. I mean, why would they, they, nothing happens in GOT for no reason? So y'all know that nothing. They bring these things up for a reason. And he said, then he Walder Frey ends it with remind the Blackfish who really got married at the Red Wedding. He called it the Red Wedding. Walder Frey called it the Red Wedding. That's the Red Wedding is what the audience and. What we're, what, you know, I guess you could say the Walder Frey it shouldn't be a problem him saying it. But I mean, that's, that's like the nickname that the commoners and everybody else gives the wedding, you know. So for, to hear Walder Frey calling it the Red Wedding, significant. You know, he's like living off his own legend at this point. You know what I mean? To use the nickname of it. Um, so he tells um, 
uh, Walter Frey is telling his sons, T- show the black fish who really got married at the wed- wed- uh, Red Wedding. Then Edmure comes up from the dungeons and he looks like his face got kicked in by a mule. It's like one of those cartoons with like spit coming out of his mouth and like, Ugh. you know, it's funny. My boy, James, James Bouchel, shout out, check his, his vids out. He's, he, he said they gave him a, they, they shaved his beard, but they didn't give him a haircut, which is like, yeah, that's silly. Uh, Edmure comes out of the dungeons and he and Walder ends ends the speech and his whole hoopla by saying, "Cheer up, Edmure, you're going home." So obviously Edmure is going to River Run to go see his uncle, the Blackfish. So that was very interesting. So what I was getting at at all this was, if you listen to every keyword he's saying. All this leads me to believe Lady Stoneheart is coming back. That's me. Uh, choking on their laughter, the Brotherhood Without Banners, you know. All this hoopla leads me to believe that Lady Stoneheart's coming back. And that young wife that Frey had, perfect age for Arya. Perfect age, perfect height, perfect everything. It, you know, the way Arya slipped in to kill Marin Tramp back in Bravos. She used that little girl's face and her height and everything because Marin was a pedo. He was a, he was a, he was a fucking pedophile. So it was easy for him to slip in, Arya to slip in there and, to kill Marin Trant. I think she's going to do the same thing with Walder Frey. Slip into his as his wife, <clears throat> slit his throat. <clears throat> it's just easy peasy right there. It's, everything fits fucking perfect. So last but not least, to top it all off, is Benjen the best reveal of the episode? Benjen, Benjen, Benjen. We see in the beginning, you know, but we're confirmed with it at the end. And Benjen explains to Brand everything that's happened. <clears throat> Let me try to do this quick. I've already been running at 27 minutes now. Um, tells Brand that he got stabbed in the stomach with an ice. Sword, which is the sword, magical swords the White Walkers have. The generals, not the whites, not the white zombies, but the generals, the Craster sons that are now White Walker generals with the Night King. He got stabbed in the stomach with that, and, and the children of the forest so happened to uh, um, find him and, and save him. And I believe that, you know, a lot of people have done videos on this. I believe that the, Stark, the Starks have magical blood in them, uh, personally. Magical uh, properties from the Northmen, them being kin of the Northmen, and stops the effects of the White Walkers, in my opinion. Um, the Children of the Forest, Benjamin says the Children of the Forest stabbed them in the heart with a dragon glass sword, uh, you know, dagger, and saved them. So this turns Benjamin into a half white, half man type of deal. His face, you can obviously see his face is much more paler, but his eyes aren't blue like the White Walkers. But he's not dead like the Whites. So in the books, it's Cold Hands. On the show, it's Benjamin. So pretty awesome. But the most important thing of this scene is him killing a rabbit and taking the blood out of the rabbit and having Bran drink the blood. He then tells Bran, Blood Raven, three-eyed crow will come back one day and when he comes back you'll be ready for him you're him for now you know basically he tells him that you're going to be the new blood raven now but when the old blood raven comes back you're going to be ready for him what is he going to be ready for more knowledge i mean the blood raven let him download from the matrix as much as he could but this harks back to what i was saying in my last video that the blood raven wanted to die in the matrix for a reason now, whether he's going to come back in the, in the Matrix to Bran and his visions, which I think that's how it's going to be. He's going to come back like a ghost. He's going to be a ghost in the shell. Okay, he's going to be a ghost in the Matrix coming back to Bran that way because he died in the Matrix. He did. His soul, he, he was in the visions when he died. He wasn't out of the visions. So his soul went into the Matrix. So I think that's how it's going to be. And he's going to reveal himself when he thinks Bran is ready. He doesn't think he's ready yet, but he's going to reveal himself. And if you notice, Bran is downloading knowledge from the Matrix sporadically. He's going in and out, in and out when he wants to. So, 
Blood Raven's gonna come back when he when he thinks Bran's ready, and I think that'll be much much later down the line. Um, much later, and I think it's gonna be a significant moment like Bran warging into a White Walker. Ben said that already. Warging into a White Walker. So that's the end. Um, gonna do another video on um, the Vision stuff and the Frost Scale that's coming up theater near you so please subscribe uh, please like this video and put any questions in the comments and I'll respond to them as quick as possible thanks guys take it easy